had the pleasure of meeting these three gentlemen. I've known them, a few of them before. And we had a conversation about um, half an hour ago. And I was blown away by their cleverness and intelligence. So I think for the next 30 minutes, you're going to get a lot of insights. Not all of it's going to be positive. Some of it may be saying, hey, this isn't what I expected. But it is going to be informative. Um, on my immediate left is Ilya. Ilya has asked me not to pronounce his last name, and I thank him for that. He's at Access Auto, which is a subprime lender. Um, beside uh, Ilya is Evan Krapko. He's at Trust Science. Trust Science is actually I'm going to say the most interesting, so I'm going to apologize to Ilya and Charles. Um, they're a mixture of a credit bureau and a credit decisioner at the same time. So it, it, it's a, a new, not a new, it's an entity that is expanding. And then on my far left is Charles Perron. Uh, Charles is also a subprime lender, one of the largest, and prime lender, one of the largest in Canada, um, non-OEM or captive based. Um, the three of them are going to, you know, answer questions. I've asked them to disagree with each other because I, I think the most interesting part of a panel is not groupthink, but how each person envisions the world slightly differently. And so I'm going to start with, and we have 28 minutes for three really clever people talking, so good luck to us, but we'll see how far we can get down the, the questions. Um, the first one we were going to ask is, um, how has the innovation streamlined the processes that you've seen in your business? I'm going to start this with Evan because it starts focusing in the decision and then moves into the other areas. Sure. Thanks, Jonathan, and uh, thank you, everybody, for your attention. Um, the, the innovation primarily that you've been reading about the last number of years is AI in the last couple of weeks or months is generative AI. The way it's uh, changed the business, in our case, it is the business. I was uh, saying that to, the, to my co-panelists, we got this going many years ago before uh, AI was widely recognized. And I took a lot of ribbing around whether or not I was building Terminator robots. So the meetings devolved into joking around about HAL and Skynet and so on. But the, 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 the tough thing is, operationalizing a lot of what was academic theory 45 years ago, not economical until uh, computing horsepower and data transmission and storage became cheaper. So the, the big revolution has been uh, making this accessible in the real world to real decision makers like each of the guys on, on either side of me here. That's not trivial and it requires paying attention to laws and regulations. So uh, Jonathan's stock and trade, uh, you don't do finance in either the US or Canada uh, and just uh, move fast and break things the way they like to say it in Silicon Valley. You do that, you move fast, break things, and then the next step is go to jail. And so uh, also as someone <laughs> legally trained, uh, trust science is extraordinarily tight with all things having to do with compliance, including, and I'll take exception with a statement made near in one of the beginning panels, there aren't three credit bureaus in Canada now, TransUnion and Equifax, of course. Trust Science is one of them registered as a bureau in all provinces that require uh, such a registration. There are, are others who are in one or another province, but um, this is not something that you do uh, by yourself at home. This, this is uh, many years in the making and tens of millions of dollars. Okay, so Charles, we hear what Trust Science is doing. How does that just focus in on your business and how you've changed your processes, if at all, based on what they and their, and I hate to say there are competitors, to what they do? Um, it helps us to support our growth. You now, when you look at uh, auto finance, you now we're not the top specialty non-prime lender, so we're not a bank. So with innovation, we were able to catch up on banks, and you now those competitive advantage diminish over time. So by using fintech, we were able to catch up on that. Uh, when I look at the growth we had, you now we more than tripled the portfolio uh, in, in in five years, but the number of ways stay the same. So for us, that was the big game changer. When, when we have flings, like we have flings earlier today, talk about you know, what they bring on the table, 
that kind of fintech, that kind of technology help us to, to get competitive. And Ilya, is that your experience as well? Absolutely. I mean, speed and efficiency, you can summarize it that quickly. Um, it's about processing more data cheaper. It's about processing more data uh, faster and delivering a product that you know, our customers are dealers. So as long as we can deliver a product uh, that's accurate and quick to them, that's what they want. So that's what FinTech allows us to do. So I'm an insolvency lawyer at times as well. Does the decision-making process reduce my need because they get the uh, decisions better than they were five years ago, ten years ago? That's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I'll answer it that way. I think that what technology does from an adjudication perspective, it removes the human element. Uh, it removes emotions, it removes processing time, it removes all the elements that are not really objective. Um, in terms of, you know, insolvencies or not, I, a macroeconomic environment has a lot to do with that, and I think a, a lot more than any decisions that we'll ever make. So, you know, I, it's, it's an objective view of a person's situation point in time, and though, uh, even though things change as that loan is on our books, uh, that decision is ultimately what forms the basis for that relationship. And Evan, do you, I mean, we had the discussion earlier and you were saying your success rate or your accuracy rate has improved over time. Do you see that getting even better or have you sort of re reached a ceiling based on current trends? So take this the right way, I have an acronym, IADS. <laughs> it's about the data, stupid. Um, the, the fact of, you can talk AI and FinTech till you're blue in the face, but what's become more available now that didn't exist as recently as three or five years ago, let alone 10 years ago, um, when you're dealing in the current um, world, these things didn't exist you know, as recently as themselves 20 years ago. So the kinds and the amount of data that you can get in real time, if you can operationalize it in the moment when a decision needs to be made, and I'm stressing decision, I'm not talking about rendering scores or any, you know, point solutions. When you buy low, sell high, starts with the leads. It starts with then a verifying data that is being self-represented. It goes through to these gentlemen's businesses uh, servicing and collections, it, it then for an asset light lender, you have to originate or you, you're packaging up an ABS and then you're having conversations with the hedge funds. There is everything I've just said has aspects of intelligence and data being required. And so yes, it's, it's absolutely um, getting better and better and smarter. And if it is a legitimate learning system and it's got legitimately figured out how to access alternative data in real time, it can't but help to get smarter. I had investors who were talking about shutting the company down when COVID hit. <clears throat> we had just come into a legally compliant way, being a, we call it Credit Bureau Plus across North America, fourth fastest growing FinTech in the Western Hemisphere, and they're saying, we're gonna shut it down because of COVID. <laughs> I said, guys, I just spent double digits of millions of dollars and years building this platform COVID or, or um, disruption or chaos teaches a system. It teaches the, the reason that auto, uh, the people on this stage um, and others are harnessing FinTech is because it, this, the systems are taking advantage and learning from all of what's gone on. And so um, I say if you lock a baby in a dark room, it's not gonna learn anything. You open the door and it touches a hot stove, COVID, bad. Uh, goes and plays with a fluffy puppy, that's dollars being wired into your bank account through CERB, good. Different behaviors, and w what happens next? Well, now interest rates and inflation, the FinTech the world over is gorging on a massive multi-billions of people experiment that would be unethical to have conducted artificially. So it's, yes, it's getting smarter and smarter to the point that I think it should be spooky. I know Halloween was yesterday. You should all be worried about this, in a sense, that it's that, it's that powerful. Yeah, I'm gonna play devil's advocate on that. I sat in so many different lectures over the last decades, how everything is getting better. 
and then we go into a recession. So <laughs> I'm I will be curious when we have this summit next year to find out whether the accuracy level is in fact what we believe. I'm, I'm skeptic. So Charles, when we're talking about seeing fintechs in your industry, and I'm gonna, this is more Ilya and, and to Charles, they're potential competitors of yours because they offer different process, or not processes, they offer the same type of product that you're offering. Do you see them? I mean, I, I know you see yourself as a fintech, but do you see young companies coming up who are going to take some of the market share that you currently hold? Uh, I don't see us as a fintech, and I don't see them as a competitor. For, for me, what is the, the biggest challenge? No, we, we have to deal with the dealership, and the dealership are tough to change. You know, the, the way they, they do business, uh, you, you mentioned earlier about the turnaround time. We're at the stage right now that if we go faster in the turnaround time, it won't make a big change on, on the business level because the dealers are satisfied with the current model. For me, what, the, the way I, I look at the FinTech, they will help us to, to, to bring a new business model, to change the habits. Uh, if I look at the next five years, we can continue with that business model. But right now, if you look at all the sales, all of car sales, the journey always starts online. If you want a new car, you go to the OEM website, you go to the dealership website. You want a used car, you go to Kijiji, Auto Trader, Marketplace, name it. But the thing that we don't see right now is those sales closing online. And that's the part that's going to come. Uh, I'm quite confident on that one. And that's why I see the FinTech helping lenders, like more traditional lenders like us, uh, getting there. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't think I see fintechs as, as competitors. Um, I see them as vendors that try to improve certain parts of what we do. Um, and I, I think there's a really big difference uh, between different fintech companies. A lot of them got funded in 2021 when capital was abound and was free. Um, but, you know, frankly speaking, I don't think all of them are going to make it because some of them are better than others. And so, um, when I think about what they bring to the table, they need to find their place in that, you know, in the workflow that exists in auto finance in Canada. Uh, it's frankly a workflow that is antiquated, uh, you know, and I'll be the first to say that it needs to be revolutionized as this panel is about. Um, but it's the way fintechs approach that issue which is key. Uh, if they have enough runway and they have a better mousetrap that can uh, actually find users, that's great. We'll work with them all day long. I just hope that more and more of them approach it that way. So what you're saying, I think, is that they're taking the old model and trying to put better pavement on it, to use that expression, as opposed to finding a new highway entirely. Yeah, I would, I would say that's accurate. I think um, they're trying to pave parts of the road, uh, not even all of it, right? And ultimately, it's about who uses that particular technology and how it's being used. Um, again, there are too many in the market today. There's going to be consolidation in the fintech space. There's no doubt about it. I, hopefully, the better technologies will prevail. But what I see happening is, you know, those specific fintech technologies will get absorbed into the larger systems that we as parts of the auto lending, uh, you know, environment use. So it's either the DMS systems that the dealers use or the LOS systems that we use. Uh, the fintech innovation will become part of it eventually. Okay, I'm gonna change tracks, and I'm, this is a question I didn't even discuss with you before. I told you that was gonna happen. What's the biggest challenge you see in the auto finance industry in the next three to six years? Is it the direct to customer that you see the OEMs doing? Is it something else? Are there legislative changes that you see coming down the pike that is going to make your life more miserable? Or in fact, is it possible it will make your life better? <laughs> I, I, that's a, that was a joke. I've never known the legislative change. <laughs> uh, I can go first on that one. So, so for me as a specialty non-prime lender, 
Uh, right now, our business model is based on dealership in, FN, in FNI. Um, and I, did, I see the shift moving from, from that power uh, to the consumer. Uh, so how, how, uh, how as a specialty non-prime lender, we relevant to the consumer, we, we there for them, and we can compete against with the big players there. So for me, that's, that's the biggest challenge I see moving forward is we're going to change completely the, the shift of power to the consumer and uh, that will have an impact. Ilya? Well, I would add transparency to it. Um, I think that a lot of different fintechs are working on delivering more transparency to the consumer. I would, I would add speed to it um, because again, right now the, the way the consumer ultimately gets to a lender is long antiquated and non-efficient. And so with new technologies emerging, I think that'll change. It'll become a lot better, a lot faster. Uh, and the last thing I would say is, um, it's not that the dealer will go away. I think dealers will just change the way they do business. And that's something that we really want to see because it has to become more efficient. It has to become more efficient for us as lenders, but also for them as dealers. Because when it's not efficient, it's just burning cash. It's, that's, that's not a good thing. Yeah, I believe the CLA actually did a white paper on what they saw as the future of the auto dealer. I think it was two years ago, if my memory serves me correctly. And it was going through the matters that you have just discussed, which was, which was interesting. So let, let's move it then to the next topic. Do you see that there are barriers for you being able to use technology as efficiently as you could? Do you see, and I'm gonna go back, because I'm a lawyer, are there legislative problems such as, you know, dealers not being able to use e-contracts, et cetera, that, that you see as problematic in making the transaction cheaper and faster than it otherwise would? And I all three of you, because it, it hits all three of your areas. Privacy as well. I'm happy to start. So I think the biggest, um, challenge is how those technologies can be integrated into the existing workflow. So there is only a few, I would say, main systems that are being used by pretty much all the players in auto lending in Canada. And if a new technology is not part of that environment, it's very difficult to convince either the dealer or the lender to use it. So I would say that's probably the biggest challenge for them to get integrated into uh, you know, a process that is already in existence. And then in terms of you know, legislative changes, we know how slow those come along. So I think we'll have plenty of time to adopt when and if and when they do. Evan? Um, our customers are lenders, non-prime and subprime lenders, and so the main answer to your question for me is what affects them, and that would be rate caps, and uh, we've seen that in the U.S. a lot, and and here, um, in an environment where interest rates have, you know, the, the prime uh, rate's been 10x over what it was two years ago. That kind of change um, is it can be harmful to the ultimate customer which is the consumer borrower, so my customer's customer, uh, who is in need of that kind of uh, help or support or choice, is in a real bind if you put uh, subprime lenders out of business. Um, and so I see that from our business itself more directly. It's just the legislation around um, AI, the executive order in the US that just uh, came out the other day, that earlier this week, around AI. Um, Trust Science prides itself uh, on being proactive and working with the regulators, so uh, we're compliant in all jurisdictions that we operate. We, in fact, engage them and deliver white papers or workshops to the regulators about the impact of this new technology that's coming so that they're, you know, hopefully they don't do any damage by when they do move, uh, moving in the wrong direction or in some, in a way that's doesn't make sense with the technology. Charles? Uh, so for, for me, I would say I, we are, I see two big challenges in the future. Uh, even mentioned it, it's one thing to get data, 
but we need to have efficient data and get organized. And right now we get buried by data. So that's, that's the biggest challenge. It's not, it's how to use them, okay? And that, that would be the first one. And the second one for me is uh, nothing against a FinTech company. Uh, every week I'm getting a call from a FinTech company for a presentation, if not two. And it's how to pick them, how can you choose them? And uh, like uh, Ilja said, is they're not all gonna survive. They all bring something different. So for us as a lender is to pick the right one and which one we want to partner with. That's a challenge in the future, like the volume is there. This is really off topic, so I'm gonna go, sorry. How do you choose between the, fin like what are the key factors that you're looking at when you may have a presentation by two companies who are providing similar services? What are the key factors that you're looking at in making that who you're going to go with, if any? Is it the management? Is it their financial stability? Is it, do they give you extra money? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, of course, it's all about ROI, right? Uh, but uh, for us, I would say the most important aspects would be um, ease of use, reliability. Those two would be paramount because, uh, again, our business is built on delivering uh, a product to the dealers as fast and as accurate as possible. So those two factors would be uh, my top two. Charles? Same here. Let me just go down a different path. Is there something that you would like to see built that has not yet been built? Would it be a better collections process, a better KYC process? Is there something out there that you haven't seen yet that you think of and you go, wouldn't it be nice? So that I don't, I'll, I'll uh, get my co-panelists off the hook so that they don't have to say it, but I think a lot of people in the auto industry might like that um, dealer track gets improved either <laughs> organically or uh, by force or something else happens. I think that's one. No, that's futuristic. I mean, that's. <laughs> I, I really wasn't actually going there, but in fact, I mean, I have heard a few people mention that over time. I'm not sure from where. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think it would be great to have an alternative. I think we as lenders would welcome an alternative and dealers would welcome an alternative too. Uh, I know, I don't know if the guys are in the audience, I know some people that are working on it, hopefully they're successful. What about on the collection side? I mean, you're lenders and you put out the money, but you often want to get it back, generally on time. It, could collections, are there ways that we could improve collections through a FinTech solution that you don't currently see? Or have you found some really efficient techniques of doing that? Uh, there's been actually quite a bit of innovation around collections and uh, it's all about how you contact the customer faster, how you offer them ease of use in terms of making up that payment, uh, different uh, sort of payment rails and whatnot. So uh, it's actually been good to see that people are working on solutions in that space. Um, and I'm sure there's more to come. It's as the world gets more and more connected, I think there'll be new technologies that'll emerge there as well. Charles? Uh, one of the comments during the AY panel was the, um, the human touch with that technology. So for me, I, I, I truly believe you know, in collection, the human touch is still important. But like Ilja mentioned, um, so many improvement has been done now about the timing you need to call, uh, to call the, the consumer, when to collect and so on. So uh, we can leverage those, te those technology, but the human touch would be there at the end of the day for sure. So now let's go down that path one more. What about in the circumstance of an absolute default in the repossession? Do you see solutions out there that have assisted you in this, or do you feel that we're still back where we were five or 10 years ago uh, with at the, at the final part of the process? I'm not gonna, <clears throat> I hope there's no regulators watching this, but um, <laughs> I think there hasn't been much change, honestly. Uh, and we're experiencing issues that I don't think we could have been even sort of, could be part of a risk matrix five, six years ago. You know, there's a shortage of bailiffs in Canada. You know, who would have thought that would be an issue? So if we have to repossess cars, 
we actually pay premiums now to get our cars first. Sorry, Charles. But um, those are things that could be helped uh, through regulatory channels, um, but I don't think they're on anybody's priority list. So um, I don't know that that's going to change anytime soon. Charles? Uh, I don't think I have anything to add on that one. Like the, the biggest part with that, with repossession, is the, the physical aspect, is the car by itself. Uh, that's the biggest problem. Uh, so the improvement in that area are slow, like like Ilja mentioned. And uh, so I don't see a lot of changes in the coming years on that. Yeah. And I know there's um, a lot of panels right now on fraud, so I'm not going to go down that path because I see that as a huge area. One area that has actually crept up recently with a number of our clients is on the, and this goes to auto lending a fair amount, is repairers who have a super priority lien over the finance company and you getting information. Has it a FinTech come to you yet with the solution of how that data could be shared? Or Evan, this may fall into your area as well. Has anyone come up and said when a repair lien is issued, how you as lender find out about it? Wow, wouldn't that be a good business? Anyone want to, it's actually really easy, you go to the, um, but would that be helpful if you knew that? Like if you found out there was a $5,000 repair on your $8,000 uh, asset? Absolutely it would be. I don't think anybody has built that. And I think that our solar legislation in Canada is outdated to say the least. I think there is some um, work required and, I, and I'm sure uh, the CLA can play a role in that as well. Um, if, uh, if you know, any fintechs are listening, uh, here's a product idea for you. Um, figure out a way to have a database on insurance. Because one of the things that we as auto lenders struggle with is identifying and understanding when clients lose their insurance, which of course is a big risk. So if somebody can you know, solution that, both at the point of origination of a loan where insurance is actually being issued, and then at the point where insurance is being either canceled or is you know, under duress or whatnot, that would be a fantastic product. I can guarantee you'll have a lot of customers in a flash. So in the last 30 seconds, we now realize that there is a business out there for an innovative entrepreneurial company. Two businesses, one on repairs and how the lender can find out, and two on the insurance side. So we have had value out of this discussion in any event. I want to thank the three panelists. This was really informative and really enjoyable and really fun. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.